Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Our speaker today, Alex Epstein, is one of the world's most innovative champions of fossil fuels. He is founder of the Center for Industrial Progress, and in an energy debate where fossil fuels are often condemned, Alex argues that they are the life-giving energy of the future, and says that we should celebrate, not demonize, the industry that creates them. He has defended fossil fuel energy in debates against Greenpeace, 350.org, and the Sierra Club, as well as environmentalist leader Bill McKibben. A philosopher by training, Alex challenges many of our era's popular notions about energy, industry, and environment. Alex is the author of Fossil Fuels, Improve the Planet, and his new book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. We were told our fossil fuel usage would bring ecological disaster on a cataclysmic scale. Earth was supposed to be uninhabitable by now. Yet, life is better than ever. People around the world have climbed out of unspeakable poverty. By any measure, our environment is better than it's ever been. This, all powered by coal, oil, and natural gas. But how? How could the experts have been so wrong? Not only wrong, but hysterical and reactionary and rude, stifling progress in the process. I'm Alex Epstein, founder of the Center for Industrial Progress, and I have a question. Isn't it time someone made the moral case for the use of more fossil fuels? Wind and solar power remain unreliable. Fossil fuels burn cleaner and cheaper than ever to advance our growing world. They save lives in operating rooms, fight famine, heat, and cool homes in the most extreme places. Without fossil fuels, society slides backwards. It's good that we use fossil fuels. Our world would be better if we used more. We can no longer deny the big picture, the real picture. The truth must be exposed. The time is now. It's here. The moral case for fossil fuels. Please give a warm welcome to Alex Epson. Keystone Pipeline. And there's a graph here that I think is, is really interesting. 
that kind of tells the story of this contradiction about what we believe about fossil fuels versus what we do about fossil fuels. So this is, this is from uh, 1980, uh, this is to 2012, basically the present. It's just a little bit taller now. And I picked 1980 because that's the year uh, I was born in 1980, a lot like today. You know, just like I today am being told we should be cutting back on fossil fuels, we need to get off fossil fuels. Uh, my parents, when they had me, the first of their four children, were, were being told, hey, you guys need to turn back, uh, stop using so many fossil fuels. And their generation in the world completely violated that advice, as you can see here. So you see this, this massive increase, an 80% increase in the use of fossil fuels. And you can see that we've started to use other energy sources, particularly nuclear and hydro, a little bit more. But there's vast, vast growth in fossil fuels. And just to give one more perspective on it, I want to ask, think about what, what do you think is the fastest growing source of energy today in the world? So I'll give, you, um, I'll give you a couple of options. So coal, oil, gas, nuclear, hydro, solar, wind. Those, those are the seven kind of discussed. So who thinks coal is the fastest growing source in the world? OK, who thinks oil? You got to raise those hands high with confidence. <laughs> Oh, that, that about tripled my perception of how many of you said that. Natural gas. Um, nuclear. Hydroelectric. Solar. Wind. And so in terms of growth, by fastest growing, there, there are kind of two potential interpretations. One is the rate of growth relative to what it is now. So even if something is just producing uh, you know, a couple of megawatts of energy, if that doubles, that's a fast rate. But by fastest growing, I really mean in absolute terms, what are we using more and more and more? Because that's going to mean what are we spending the resources on, what kinds of emissions are there. So the answer is coal. Coal was the fastest growing source of energy in the world. In the last 30 years or so, China, both China and India have both quintupled their use of coal. And the international, various international energy agencies are projecting vastly more use of coal going forward. So this is, this is the trend we're on. Now the, the big question though is, is this a good thing? And, and certainly the prevailing answer, the answer that I always learned throughout my life, you know, I grew up in the East Coast, went to school in the East Coast, and now I live on the West Coast, certainly in all of those places, we're taught the prevailing answer is, is absolutely no. This, this, is very, this is very bad. The, and the term that's used is this, is this is an addiction. This is something that we're doing now. Maybe it seems convenient. Maybe you'll get a couple of jobs from the Keystone Pipeline now. But if you keep doing this in the future, it's going to be very destructive. And this is a very important argument to make since they're, they're I disagree with it fundamentally, but I think there's a certain truth to it, and in any case, it certainly has to be engaged. And I think understanding this argument really depends on understanding what fossil fuels are. So I'm just curious, how many, how many of you feel confident you could give me like a decent definition of what fossil fuels are? Raise your hands proudly. I'm not necessarily going to call on you, <laughs> although I'm not necessarily not going to call on you. Okay, so this, this is just this is worth pausing on because I, I had the same experience. I um, I was fortunate enough to go to uh, to have a lot of very strong math science based education, both in high school um, and in college when I was at Duke University, and it was really interesting because I heard lots and lots of people tell me how bad fossil fuels were and all the disasters they were causing. But there's one question, or more than one, but one question in particular I never, that was never asked or answered, which is what exactly are fossil fuels? <coughs> which is weird, right? Because we're supposed to have these opinions. I'm supposed to be convincing you of my strong opinion. Someone else is supposed to be convincing you of their strong opinion. Yet we're not even clear what we're talking about. And I think the intro mentioned by backgrounds in philosophy is, has anyone here ever read Socrates through Plato? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, it's definitely worth reading. There's some very small books called The Dialogues, but in the book The Republic, which is Plato's masterpiece, he has this character. I mean, basically, Plato, Socrates is Plato's teacher, and Plato's books feature Socrates as a character. Socrates, he's called the gadfly. He's really annoying. He goes around asking everyone, 
what do you mean by that? So there's a guy named Thrasymachus who's kind of uh, is angry about something and is talking about, uh, uh, I believe, about justice. And Socrates is saying, what exactly do you mean by justice? And Thrasymachus can't give a definition of justice. He's not really clear about it. And it's just a really fascinating thing. And it just really solidified to me, if we're not clear on what we're talking about, then we can't have a strong opinion about it. Understanding a concept or an idea comes before having a strong opinion about the idea. So we could say this is what fossil fuels are, I think. Not a formal definition, but I think it really, really captures it. So I'll break it up. It's high energy hydrocarbons, many of which originated from ancient dead plants. So the hydrocarbons point is going to be really important, and the ancient dead plants point is going to be really important, and the high energy point. So you can see then this hydrocarbons part of it. <coughs> I think you, you can see it decently. Basically, big surprise, there's a bunch of hydrogen atoms and carbon atoms bonded together. Okay, so take it any kind of chemistry, you have some idea. The idea is that those bonds, the things that are holding those atoms together, are very strong. And so if you can figure out a way to break apart those bonds, which you do by adding oxygen into the mix, burning them, basically what happens is the, the carbon attaches to oxygen. What does that become? when carbon attaches to oxygen? Carbon dioxide. carbon dioxide, which is related to global warming, which is why it's important to understand. And then the hydrogen turns into what? Water. Water, right? So you have this thing, you have these hydrocarbons, you burn them, combust, energy is released, and the main byproducts are carbon dioxide and water vapor. Make sense? So you have in that process both the appeal of the energy, which is that you have a large amount of energy stored in a small space, but also particularly with the CO2, one of the major concerns about the energy. And then another major concern is based on the fact that it comes from ancient dead plants. You can see this, and this is, this is a simplified description of a picture of how coal gets generated, but it's kind of similar to the others. Basically, there's dispute about what percentage of coal fossil fuels or hydrocarbons come from ancient dead plants, but um, I think a lot do. And the basic process is you have the plants, and plants have a certain amount of energy, and over time, they get piled up, and through heat and pressure, they get really, really compressed. The water comes out of them, you get, you get sort of the purest energy, the most condensed energy. Now, why is this important? Well, part of it is because there were only so many plants to be compressed, right? There wasn't an infinite amount of plants that got compressed. So to the extent you're limited by plants, there's a concern about there's only so much of this stuff. And once you, once you burn it, it's not there, right? Once I burn the gallon of gasoline, those <coughs> hydrocarbons are not there in the, for, in the form that's useful. And then the other thing that's going on is that, um, and I'll, I want to write, I'll, I'll put it in these, in these terms. These are kind of the three concerns. So one is this idea of non-renewable. There's only so many plants that, that got compressed into fossil fuels, so there's a worry we're going to run out. And then with CO2 emission, uh, well, I'll do the second one. The other thing related to plants, though, is, is impurity. So in plants, plants aren't just made of uh, hydrogen and carbon. They also have all kinds of other elements in them, like nitrogen and sulfur. So if you have fuels that are based on plants that have nitrogen and sulfur in them, what's going to happen when you burn those? So when nitrogen combines with oxygen, it's yeah, various nitrogen oxides. And when sulfur combines with oxygen, it's what? Sulfur. Yeah, sulfur dioxide, which is what thing in the air? Especially in Los Angeles, where I'm from. Acid rain. Yeah, acid rain, smog, these kinds of things. So when you, the idea is that understanding both, again, the, the benefits and the risks of this is very important to just understand. It kind of very simply follows from what it is. And then we're going to look at, well, how big are the benefits and how big are the risks. But it's important to understand how the thing works in the first place before we have a, uh, an opinion about it. So anyway, these impurities, in it, the ex and particularly they exist more, the most in coal and the least in natural gas, but to the extent you have these and you burn enough of this stuff in a concentrated enough space, you can have a lot of sulfur dioxide in the air, you can have a lot of nitrogen oxide in the air, and that can be harmful uh, to human breathing. So that's, that's a kind of concern. So you have, and then the third one is the most common, is that the CO2, CO2 is a greenhouse gas or more technically an infrared absorber. So without going into a ton of detail, 
Uh, it, it generally has a warming effect because sunlight hits the earth, the infrared portion of the light reflects back, the infrared absorber reflects in the infrared back and you have some increase in the amount of heat in the energy system. Now, all of these are a big question of magnitude, like how fast are we running out? You know, it makes a big difference if it's uh, 10 years or a million years. Impurities makes a big difference. Are there, in, you know, an insurmountable amount of these or can we deal with them? Warming, it's, if there's a little bit or a ton, you know, that those are very different kinds of things. But in any case, these are, these are the concerns. And the concerns tend to be, we're running out of them really fast. There's an insurmountable amount of pollution. It's gonna be really, really dirty. It's, China's gonna get worse and worse and worse. And with warming, it's gonna be not just a mild warming, but a runaway warming. So on the one hand, and this, you know, this, is, this is very commonly believed, even in the extreme form. And so we have this contradiction, and, and you really, as voters, and as people who are gonna live in this future, and some of you might be considering going into the field of energy, which is maybe one of the fastest growing fields in the US, you know, you have a real moral choice. Because the question is, what are we gonna do about these fossil fuels? On the one hand, we're using more and more and more of them. And on the other hand, there's a large contingent who says that the concerns with them are so large as to be catastrophic, and we need to radically reduce them. And you know, on some political issues, people have like little differences. This is one on which there are massive differences. So if you look at, say, the, the, the entities, many of the, the major entities focused on the climate issue, such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, there, that basic policy and the policy that is, is accepted by many countries. Now it's accepted in words when they don't actually act on these policies yet and haven't and they've broken all their commitments in the past for the most part. Um, interestingly, the US has broken it the least even though they didn't commit, it's a whole interesting story. But anyway, there's this big push for 80%, like 80% restriction of current <coughs> levels or even of 1990 levels, which are even lower. So the vast majority you know, of the coal that people burn to generate electricity, of the gas people use to heat their homes, of the oil people use to move their cars, to do farming, that needs to be stopped, that needs to be reduced, and it needs to be replaced by something else. And usually the, you know, the leaders there are solar, wind, and then biofuels, which are plant-based, plant-based fuels. So that's, that's one kind of spectrum, which is very dramatic to say, in a world where Left to our own devices, we choose to use more and more fossil fuels, presumably because there's some benefit there. What they're saying is it's such an addiction, it's so damaging, that you need to use far less. You need to go back to levels that haven't been seen you know, in, in decades and decades and decades and decades, when you had far, far smaller, far poorer populations. But then, at the same time, in actual practice, we're pl people are planning on using even more. So this, this is a huge gulf, and it's a, it's a moral issue. There's a, all of us are part of the choice. What are we actually going to do? And I, I want to raise this, this question. Um, it's pretty clear from most of what we hear what the stakes are if it turns out that, that it's a catastrophic addiction. So, for example, I mean, you see, you know, if any of you have seen an inconvenient truth, or you see a lot of things about. You know, you hear there's going to be mass drought, people won't be able to grow food, sea levels will rise rapidly, you know, cities won't be able to cope. There's that, there's the, the idea of places more and more polluted like China, it's only going to get worse and worse. And the idea that we're going to be, we, we depend on these fuels and yet we're going to run out of them and then we're going to really be in big, big trouble. Those, in the culture, those are everywhere. So if, if we look at sort of the downside, if, if there is a catastrophic addiction and we ignore it, and we keep using more and more fossil fuels, that's, that's the downside, again, if. But I want to ask the question that's not asked very often. What's the negative consequence if it's not a catastrophic addiction, or if it's just really, really important and not replaceable by solar and wind in the time frame discussed? What's the downside of getting off fossil fuels or of restricting fossil fuels? That, that's a real question. Okay, decreased standard living. Can you elaborate on how that might work? Industry wouldn't have as much energy to produce things that so people wouldn't have jobs to work at factories. 
Okay, perfect. So industry wouldn't have as much energy. People wouldn't have as many jobs at factories. Other things. Food production. Food production. So can you elaborate on that? Uh, we use a lot of energy to make fertilizers and to store food and to cultivate. Yeah, so in particular, in food we use, uh, we use a lot of natural gas to make fertilizers, which is a fossil fuel, and then we use a lot of diesel fuel, which is a form of oil fuel, uh, to run the, all of the machines that harvest our food, you know, that are the difference between us using a hand plow and a modern harvester can, can reap enough wheat for 500,000 loaves of bread a day. So all, the fact that everyone in the world can eat as much as they can is based on having high energy agriculture. So if fossil fuels were heavily restricted and we didn't have something as good or better, that would be a really big problem. Anything else? Standard of healthcare. Standard of healthcare, can you elaborate? Uh, well, get, hospitals wouldn't have energy to produce, to run x-ray machines, to get, uh, make and produce medicines and things like that. Yeah, so uh, we'll get into this a little later, but the more you look at energy, it's involved everywhere. You think about, for instance, just all the places you <coughs> use electricity how valuable electricity is. You can't really go anywhere in modern life, whether it's uh, you know, this room or a hospital or a restaurant or a grocery store without seeing, wow, electricity is completely fundamental. So we'll talk about that more later, but um, I just want to stress that it's a really high stakes choice and there are big downsides to being wrong both ways. So it's the kind of thing that we have to really think about. It's worth putting thought into, because if you get it wrong, people die. I mean, it's just that simple. If you get it wrong, people die. So if you restrict fossil fuels unnecessarily, people die. If you fail to restrict fossil fuels and you need to, people die. So this is just a very serious issue. It's part of the reason the book is called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, because it's an issue of right and wrong. Are we making the right decision for the future? So this is another question. How do we how do we decide? So you're not in particular, you're you know, all of you aren't going to go into this subject for a living, and even if you did, you'd find that there's so much complexity to it that you can't become a master in every aspect. So what's your thought on how do you how do you decide who's right? Not who's right, or even how do you decide what's right? Yes. Okay, so the answer to that question is to, to do Aristotle, that, right? Just to find the happy median, the mean, the golden mean, uh -huh. and to say to yourself, okay, we've probably got enough that we could devote some resources to developing alternative fuels or to make the fossil fuels cleaner and so forth. But we don't have to say we've only got 30 years to cut our production or cut our use by 80%. And like, you know, so find the middle ground. So the golden, golden mean is a really interesting thing in Aristotle because you know, it's mostly about virtues. It's like, you know, you with courage, like you don't want to be too strong on one side, you don't want to be too weak on the other. So I, in a sense, I agree with that, but it's, it's yeah, you have to find, you, you have to find the outcome that makes the most sense, that's overall the most beneficial. I think the aspect of that that I read into what you're saying is, is that you have to look at the benefits and the risks uh, clearly. And you can't. Is that accurate or am I making that up? Um, well, carry on. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so we'll talk more about this later. It's, it's, it is an interesting issue. There's a lot of interesting aspects to how to decide. But I think for me, the, the biggest thing and the thing that's most missing is what I would call big picture thinking. So this is thinking carefully and precisely about the risks and the benefits and the alternatives. So thinking carefully about the risks and the benefits and the alternatives. And what I think you'll find is that when people take sides on this issue, when it becomes a political issue, they'll tend to only look at one uh, or the other. So I'll give you a couple of, of examples of I think where this, this isn't being done right. So there's the issue of being, of being balanced. So you want to look at the benefits, risks, and alternatives. And so one is, one version of, of I think, go, going wrong here is there's this, you know, people ask you, well, do you believe in global warming? Or 97% of scientists believe in global warming. 
Therefore, we need to get off fossil fuels. And we can talk about the 97% thing and to what extent that's accurate or precise, but there's just a thing there where there's essentially this amounts to fossil fuels have a side effect, therefore we shouldn't use them. But on its own, that's not a logical argument because how do we, if something has a side effect, to know if it's good or bad, we first have to look at the positive effect too. So for example, I could say, well, you know, you go to the web, website of, uh, you know, US health website, and you look at vaccines, and every single vaccine, all these life-saving vaccines have side effects. And you can look at, you know, even one out of a thousand die from it and these kinds of things. And yet the vast majority of people choose to use antibiotics. But if you, if you said antibiotics have side effects, therefore we need to get off them, or, sorry, antibiotics, you can use the same thing, but if vaccines have side effects, you need to get off them, you'd say, well, wait, but they also save lives. So it's the issue of how beneficial they are versus how negative the side effect is. You can't just say it has a negative, therefore it's, um, it's bad. Now on the other side of the issue, and another version of this, which has to do with alternatives, is this argument which you hear a lot from the coal industry, which is coal keeps the lights on. So they'll talk about, look, look at all the places that we use coal. So like we should use coal in the future, you know, is we're, look at all these places that we're using coal. Okay, well, in part, you still have to address what about all the supposedly negative things about coal. But also the fact that we use something now doesn't mean that we have to use it in the future. You have to have an analysis of here's why coal is uniquely suited to keep the lights on. So the fact that coal can do something doesn't mean it's the, the only way it can or that it's, it's the best. So there's an issue of you can't just say, oh, here's a benefit without looking at the alternatives because it might be the alternatives have all the benefits with fewer risks. So you have to investigate this kind of thing. So uh, another one I think is, is just precision. That um, there's this, this question of do you believe in global warming? And both sides of the debate is do you believe in global warming? And yet there's a, a tremendous difference between if you believe that the greenhouse effect causes mild global warming and if you believe it causes catastrophic runaway global warming. So if I just ask someone, do you believe in global warming? That's a very imprecise question. Socrates would be all over that person. Say, so, well, which version, which version do you mean? It makes a big, it makes a big deal. And then when someone says, well, I don't believe in global warming, is it really? They don't believe that greenhouse gases have a greenhouse effect? Because I don't think that's a really hard claim to, to justify. Um, and then there's one more, which is really relevant to climate, is unchecked assumptions. So we always, if we're thinking big picture, we have to make sure we're not just assuming anything that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. So one is, this is more on the conservative side, you might have heard the argument, it's impossible to cause catastrophic global warming. As in, and, and I hear it in this one, like, it's arrogant for us to think that we could damage the planet a lot. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that makes any sense as a, you, I don't think you can declare that. It might be true at this point, but you need to have evidence. Like there's not, I don't think there's any law that says it's impossible for man to make the planet really, really bad. You have to investigate, is this specific behavior really, really damaging to the planet or not? So I don't think that assumption makes sense. Um, another kind of assumption that I don't think makes sense, usually on the other side is, well, there must be a way to replace fossil fuels with solar. And I get this all the time. Like, well, it's not working now, but it has to work in the future. Like again, you have to go by evidence. Maybe there's something about solar and wind technology that's just a really, really uh, big problem. So it's just always we need to go by evidence, we need to be precise, we need to look at all the benefits and all the risks. And um, it's part of why I got interested in this issue because my, my background is really studied a lot of math and science, but mostly philosophy. And I, once I learned how important energy was and I started looking at the debate, I was very disappointed by how illogical and imprecise the discussion was, and people are talking past each other. And with this kind of serious issue where we are making life and death choices, you can't, you can't be sloppy, you have to be uh, precise. So uh, in terms of what you come away with today, I think that the big picture method of thinking about these things is more important than my particular conclusion about fossil fuels. So let's then, if we need to look at the benefits and the risks, let's look at the benefits and the risks. And first we have to consider a, a view that's very popular, which is that fossil fuels have no unique benefits 
only unique risks. So many of the people who say we need to ban most of them in the next 30 years will say, look, their, their benefits are completely replaceable by other technologies. And one, one reason given for this is, well, renewables or solar and wind in particular and biofuels, they're, they have to be cheaper than fossil fuels because they never run out. They're based on the sun and the wind, which are free. And, and there's, there's lots and lots of energy stored in the, solar, in the sun and the wind over the globe. So Al Gore likes to say there's enough energy in 40 seconds of sunlight around the world to power the entire world economy for a year. And in terms of raw energy, that's more or less true. And so what he'll say is, well, we should use sources like solar, wind, biofuels that are free forever. That's what he calls them. Free forever. They're not going to run out. And they're using these natural sources of keep replenishing. So can any, does anyone have any objection to this? Does anything about that sound illogical to people? Yes? Uh, you can't exactly do that. You can't put solar panels all over the world. It's not possible because there's a lot of places you go there that you can't put solar panels. OK. But Al Gore would, would respond to that, well, I don't need to, right? Because it's, I just need in 40 seconds, so maybe I'll put one one thousandth of the solar panels around the world, and then we'll be totally good to go. It's also not quite as reliable as any other type of things. OK, so wait, that's a different category of coin, which is really important. It's not as reliable, presumably, because the sun turns off a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like every day. <laughs> um, anyone else? Yes? There's a difference between raw energy and harness energy. What is harness and what is actually being used? Okay, did everyone hear him? That is the most important point that's probably been made by anyone today. Did you guys hear him? Okay, yeah, there's a difference between raw energy and harnessed energy. And what do you need to get from raw energy to harnessed energy? I'm asking you. And what does that take? That takes a lot of energy. It takes using energy. There's a whole lot of chemical process. And each one has a different efficiency. It just depends on the process and what you do. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic answer. So to just simplify it a little bit, it takes a lot of resources to turn raw energy into harnessed or usable energy. So this argument ignores that. So, I actually think that one of my favorite refutations of this kind of perspective, oh, it's free, so it must be able to work, was given by Jimmy Fallon. You guys know who Jimmy Fallon is? Most of the Tonight Show. So this is a younger Jimmy Fallon. This is in the year 2000. I never forgot this. So when he, he was not taking solar and wind. He's actually a big backer of solar and wind. I don't think he understands that he actually refuted them in a certain way. But he came up with a policy. He, he was criticizing another form of renewable energy. So renewable energy is considered anything that comes from the sun and the wind, and so one form is plant-based, biofuels. So you know, we should use, for example, switchgrass or corn or sugar cane to get all of our fuel. And there was a proposal that came out that said, well, why don't we use another form of renewable energy? Let's use hazelnuts, because you can turn, because you, know, you take hazelnuts, they're oil. They have a form of oil. You can use those to power a vehicle, which is true. You can actually do it. So here's what Jimmy Fallon had to say about that. It's funny also how young he is. New Scientist magazine reported on Wednesday that in the future, cars can be powered by hazelnuts. That's encouraging, yeah? considering an eight ounce jar of hazelnuts costs about $9. <laughs> yeah, I got an idea for a car that runs on bald eagle heads and Fabergé eggs. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's funny, right? But my question to Jimmy is well, hazelnuts are renewable, right? They come from the sun, so what's the problem? And this really gets to your point. Every energy technology, energy isn't something nature gives us. Machine energy isn't something nature gives us. It is energy, it's a technology and a resource intensive process. So when you want to know whether it can provide cheap energy for a lot of people, you have to look at the whole process. You have to understand the whole process. And some processes are much more energy intensive than others. So here are things that are involved in every single form of energy. You need to mine it. And certain things are much harder to mine than others. For example, the elements in windmills, like what are called rare earth metals, are much harder
to mind and say cold because rare means, it doesn't mean there's not many of them, it means that they exist in very low concentrations. So you have to take very large amounts of metal and sort of sift them into very small amounts of metal and isolate them, that takes a lot of resources. Coal exists in relatively pure form, oil exists in relatively uh, pure form. There's processing, which you mentioned, um, turning, you know, refining the ore or whatever, manufacturing, transportation, operation, maintenance, and disposal. So when we're, when we're looking at these claims that, oh, this form of energy can replace this, you have to think about, is there truly a superior energy technology here? Is there truly a resource efficient energy technology? And whether the sun or the wind is involved with that is almost irrelevant. Because what matters is what's the total resource cost of doing the whole thing? So again, with the hazelnuts, the sun is one input there. But the point is the hazelnuts, the resources involved in making hazelnuts uh, are so much that it's completely unworkable. And if you said, we have to outlaw all energy except hazelnut energy, most people would die. I mean, it it's kind of sounds funny, but if that could be that that's the case for solar and wind. So here's one thing with solar and wind that in terms of resource efficiency. One, one problem they run into is that the sun, while there's the sun and the wind, there's a lot of energy overall, it exists in quite dilute form compared to say coal and oil and certainly compared to nuclear. So what happens is to produce more, to produce energy, you need much, much more, uh, at least you know, steel and iron. That's, that's one kind of thing. And those are interesting to analyze. One of you mentioned when you need a lot of solar panels. The thing though, I don't think that's, that's an issue, but I think by far the biggest issue comes from the thing that, that came up earlier, which has to do with the, the fact that the sun isn't working half the time, which is what's called the intermittency problem. The idea that, the, the fact that solar and wind do not come in an on-demand stream, they come intermittently. Uh, and very variably. And so the issue is we need energy, we need power on demand to power our civilization. How do you get an unreliable intermittent source to provide reliable energy? And that's where you need tons and tons of resources because you need what you really need if you want to run the world on it, you need a means of storing it. And it turns out producing the resources to store large amounts of energy really well really doesn't exist. And this is why we find it very frustrating how quickly we run out of batteries on our iPhones. Batteries can't store nearly as much energy as, say, gasoline, and they are very, you know, they're very, very expensive. So what happens in practice is um, countries just can't use that much of this kind of energy because it's not reliable. What they can do is they can, they can have it as a supplement to fossil fuels. So I want to show you what happens in, take a real world example, the leader, world leader in solar, and one of the leader, leaders in wind is Germany. So this is the German experiment. So this is, this is the most up-to-date data we could get. So this is, and the most precise data in existence, uh, we got it from you know, the official German uh, energy people who give it to you on 15, every 15 minutes. And this shows you over a year how much of the energy use is coming from solar wind. Now for various reasons, just for the technically minded, the, the reason it's flat at the top is because they won't give you daily energy consumption for everything, so it's, it's sort of an average of the month. But you can see it's falling well short, and sometimes it dips below 3%. And so if it dips below, if that's what's happening, if it's that erratic, what that means is that you still have to build all of the reliable energy that you had before. You still have to have the same capacity, which is why they're building record amounts of coal capacity, even though they spend tons and tons of money on this. So in reality, people give a lot of kind of fantasy scenarios, but in reality, the intermittency, the unreliability of solar and wind have made them failures in terms of producing cheap, plentiful, reliable energy in the world. They are not a successful energy technology because they can't do the basic thing, which is produce cheap, plentiful, reliable energy for billions, and that's what they're supposed to be doing. And so this is sort of a, a negative on one side, but a positive, it's, and in the in moral case for fossil fuels in the book, I talk about nuclear and hydro, which are much better energy technologies than solar, and much better performing, um, but still for various reasons have been unable to scale anywhere near globally in comparison to fossil fuels. And so if 
We're talking about the benefit. So the core benefit of fossil fuels is that it's a uniquely cost-effective, resource-efficient, scalable energy technology. So if billions of people are going to have energy, then you need fossil fuels. That's the only energy technology that can do it. In the same way that vaccines are the only medical technology that can insulate people from most of the risks of certain kinds of diseases, in the same way antibiotics are the only um, you know, medical technology that can cure many categories uh, of disease. That's just, that's just a fact. So that it's a unique, it's a, an incredibly unique benefit. And so this raises the question, so if this is the benefit, if, it's, if it's, this is a uniquely good source of energy, and that means billions of more people have energy who wouldn't otherwise have energy. So that, that's the benefit. So let me ask this, what is, what is the benefit of that? What's the benefit of billions of more people having more energy? I mean, it's not, it can kind of seem obvious, but we don't really talk about it in the culture. Yes? Okay, the lights are on, and the lights are also on in places where the lights aren't on now. So you can have the lights go on in the future. So, um, for example, in China and India, what you have is quintupling of fossil fuel usage in the last 30 plus years. And that has corresponded, that has allowed them to power lots of machines to make their lives much better even with all of the, the negative things that go on in those countries, that have made you know, life expectancy six years or more higher. I mean, and, and have brought many people electricity. In the world now, we still have over a billion people with no electricity and three billion with next to no electricity. So the benefit of being able to produce more of that means more of those people have the chance to get electricity. Yes? Uh, yeah, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit today. You can also ask it. Um, that's the question. Yeah, so we're, we're in the benefit section. We're about to get to the risk section. But I just want to want to subdivide them because it's important to see. Because sometimes you'll have one dynamic going one way, like you know you have better hospitals, but then if you're making people more sick, right? And, but it could be well if if your sickness rate is only going up one percent, your curing rate is going up ninety nine percent. It's still worth it. But yeah, you need to quantify those things. So that's that's a great category question. So. There's lots, it might seem obvious that there are benefits. Let me ask one question before we go to risks. Can anyone think of any environmental benefits to billions more people having more energy at their disposal? Clean water, sewage treatment. Can you elaborate on that? Clean water, sewage treatment? Yeah, you need electricity to treat sewage. And if you have power there that's available, then you can put in the infrastructure to treat waste that comes out of people's houses. The waste gets treated, your diseases go down because it keeps the water where those things automatically end up in groundwater and, and the runoff water where these people will a lot of times get their drinking water from. So you decrease diseases by treating the sewage because sewage treatment normally knocks out a vast majority of the pathogens. <coughs> drinking water requires energy to get it to potable status. And so if you have power there, then you can supply those people with uh, clean water and treat their waste. Yeah, it's an amazing point. So when we when we think of energy and environment, we're usually taught to think of how is this form of energy going to make the environment worse. But it's really important to think about how how can energy make our environment better? Because energy at its core is really our ability to use machines to do things for us. And there are a lot of ways in which our natural environment is really really unpleasant, and we need machines to do things for us. And one is water. Nature doesn't give us an endless supply of drinkable water. We need to manufacture that. So more energy will mean more, uh, more machines for people, more clean water for people. Now, how about in climate? Is there any way in which more energy can help people in terms of, uh, you know, the climate? Lower air conditioning. <laughs> okay. Well, people are laughing, but I don't think people would be laughing in a third world country if they actually got air conditioning. So yeah, we we take it for granted that. Oh yeah, there's something called air conditioning. It, but air conditioning saves, you know, million, you know, millions and millions, who knows how many million lives. And in places that are slow to adopt it, such as France, uh, you have people who, in the summer, you know, they'll have heat wave, and they'll die from lack of uh, of air conditioning. Yeah. So, 
uh, any, any other climate related benefits? Okay, I think you'll see that there's, there's going to be a lot. Okay, so let's go to the, let's go to the risks. This is, by the way, an interesting thing of just the history of the world in the last 2,000 years. There's a very strong relationship between CO2 emissions slash fossil fuel use, life expectancy, population the world can support, and GDP per person. So this unique source of energy, this unique technology, has been improving lives for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and it continues to do so today. This is a health kind of health statistic, which is created by the water, created by more hospitals. So the world is, I mean, one perspective is the world is getting much, much better. We keep hearing that it's getting worse, but it's really getting much, much better, and this kind of energy technology is really crucial. So let's look at the three, three concerns now, and then we'll take some questions, and there's going to be a panel. Um, so there's non-renewable running out. There's impurities leading to pollution, the, the health issues that you mentioned, um, and then there's CO2 emissions leading to now, there's a lot to say about these, but the thing that I think is really notable, and I indicated before, is that all of these views and these predictions of catastrophe have been around for a long time. And I had a very formative experience when I first started studying energy, and I wanted to think about, well, who's really right about this issue? I read, the, I read a lot of the history of the thinkers, especially over the last four years. And what have people been saying about these things? What have they said about solar and wind? What have they said about pollution? And there was a, a newsletter called Access to Energy, which I found to be the most helpful thing I ever read on energy. It started in 1973. And I read the back issues from then to the time uh, the guy died, which was in 1993. And what blew me away was how all the debates we're having today, and all the opinions we're having today, and all the negative predictions we hear today have been around for decades and decades and decades. And so that's relevant if we're looking, and so I want to show you some of that, but it's relevant one idea with analyzing ideas is you always want to look, does the idea have a track record? So if someone makes a prediction, you can ask, well, what is that person's track record of making predictions? Or what is this theory's track record of making predictions? So I found this really formative. So for instance, uh, this guy, Paul Ehrlich. So Paul Ehrlich is probably considered the leading ecologist of the last 40 years. Um, he's still a leading professor at Stanford University. In the 60s and 70s, he was so prominent in the media and, and so respected as the world's leading ecologist that he was on the Johnny Carson show more than 12 times. So think about that level of popularity for an ecologist. And he said, you know, in the 70s, America's economic joyride is coming to an end. There will be no more cheap, abundant energy, no more cheap, abundant fuel. And then he said in 29 years, and this was from the early 70s, the United Kingdom will simply be will be simply a small group of impoverished islands. If I were a gambler, I would take even money that England will not exist. So this is the kind of we're running out of everything new. And we hear this today. And Ehrlich last year had a major article in the Royal Society of England saying all of these same things. And it was just taken as, oh, this is a brilliant prediction for the future, and this is going to happen. And yet it didn't happen. The Club of Rome is another of the world's most prominent organizations. They said, this is in, the, in their report in, in the early 1970s, in 20 years the world will run out of oil, natural gas, in 21 years gold, mercury, silver, tin, zinc, and lead. So this did not happen. So what actually has happened with resources? This is idea we're running out. What happens is we're consuming more and more, and yet proved resources, which is basically how much, not how much is it in the earth, but how much do we have in inventory that we think we can get economically, proof reserves go up. So how is that possible? How, if it's a non-renewable resource, do we have more and more of it? Okay, mining techniques improve. But none of that is useful at all 
unless we can come up with an efficient process to harness it. So the way people think about resources is nature gives us a bunch of resources and then we gobble them up too fast and then we're going to run out. Really, nature doesn't give us any usable hydrocarbon resources. We have to create them. And so what the people making these predictions ignore is the capacity of the human mind to come up with new ways to make new things. That's why they always get it wrong. So basically, they don't look at the big picture. They only look at the negative. They only look at, hey, we're exhausting something. But they don't look at the positive. Hey, we're creating something. So it's a failure to think big picture. So pollution, I'll run through these quickly. Same kind of thing in the 70s you have, just like here with China today, this is so ominous, what are we going to do about it? There was this view that we can't, this is just going to get worse and worse and worse as long as we keep using more fossil fuels. This is a life magazine thing. Urban dwellers who have to wear gas masks to survive air pollution. So two things happened. So one is, so this is the EPA statistics for six major, um, what they would classify as pollutants. And we've used 25% more fossil fuels since the beginning of this, and yet everything has gone down. So how's that possible? More laws. More laws. OK, and how, how, do the, how are the laws complied with? Carbon taxes. Well, I mean, this doesn't have anything to do with carbon, but. Well, you're capturing it, so it's not the atmosphere. Well, but it's not, you're not capturing the CO2. You're capturing other things like particulate matter or uh, well, sulfur. What's your point that you just keyed up? which is what you're looking at is the advancement of technology back and reduction of uh, emissions coming out of the uh, various sources here. Yeah. That's what happened from 1970 to 19 to today is the application of technology. And we have been willing to incur higher costs. Right. We impose those costs on ourselves. So we don't want, we don't want to have the cost of, of air pollution. We're going to Exert uh, effort and gain uh, a reduction in the air pollution, right. but it's going to cost us money to do it. Yeah, exactly. So um, the issue of law came up. So the, however, the core issue though is, is technology. So you have to, it, even if you have a law that says you have to do this, somebody has to come up with the technology to implement it. So the point is that the people with these very negative expectations weren't necessarily counting on, hey, technology can make things better, so we can use more fossil fuels and have less pollution. This goes to, this is part of the answer to China. Technologically, we already know that it's possible to make coal plants far, far cleaner than they are in China, which means that there are technology issues and more fundamentally in China, policy uh, issues of, of people not taking air pollution seriously and having central mandates to have you know, unhealthy concentrations. Uh, quick question, yes. Yeah, well, that, I would never dispute that with, with anything. But the question is, but the question is, are you actually able to do that? So, in, in the law, just to be quick about it, what you would want is you'd have a rational, you'd have a threshold of okay, this is the acceptable amount of emissions because you're always going to have some amount of emissions of something, and then everyone has to play by those rules and then make the best technology uh, win. But in the same sense of well, before you said along that timeline. But so, so let, let's talk about the role of the law. So I think you're mixing together the use of force and the, the non-use of force. So what I'm talking about is people are saying forcibly, P, you people in Kentucky, people in Mississippi, you need to shut down your coal plants. So the thing that's giving you cheap electricity, those all need to go. Those are in oil, you're not allowed to use them. You're gonna, it's gonna lead to an apocalypse. Don't worry, solar and wind will come to the rescue. Primarily what they're proposing though is a, is a restriction. So if you propose a restriction like that, you have to have conclusive evidence that that is not going to ruin people's lives. And what I'm saying is there is no evidence whatsoever that these particular technologies can in any way approximate fossil fuels. So it would be, it'd be like saying, well, we're going to abolish all of modern medicine, and you can only use you know, what people would call holistic remedies and natural herbal things. It's on that level of arbitrariness. Um, so we talk about that more later. I want to sort of get on to the next point. And this gets to the issue of, of water, which is really interesting with pollution. We think of fossil fuels are ruining water, and yet water quality has gotten way, way better as we've used more fossil fuels. 
So more people have more clean water. So people think about, oh, if we use fossil fuels, it's a risk to the water. Actually, it's a risk to the water if we don't use fossil fuels. Because if we don't have the energy, if we have less energy for less people, which is what restricting fossil fuels means, we have less capacity to make clean water for people. Now let's talk about climate, which is kind of the biggest thing right now. So this is James Hansen. He's, cons he's considered by the media, or he's at least been made by the media to be the world's leading uh, climate scientist. And so he has said, in 1986, he came to prominence saying that basically the next 10 years, and so that was in basically the 90s, temperatures would rise by one half to one degree Fahrenheit, and then in, in the 2000s, they'll rise two to four degrees Fahrenheit. So, and this is another guy, that, that this was in the thing, uh, Bill McKibben, a few more decades of ungoverned fossil fuels and will burn up to put a So by now, it's supposed to be really, 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 really hot, like to the point where our lives are getting ruined, more people are dying. This has been predicted for decades. So when people predict it now, they've just shifted the doomsday date, right? But the doomsday has been predicted for decades and decades and decades by the same people. But it hasn't come true, and this is kind of the interesting thing. We, we're using much more CO2 than ever. It's increasing very rapidly. And yet, the temperature is not going up that much or very consistently, and particularly if you see at the end, in the, in the last 15 years, which is when Hansen said it was going to go from two to four degrees, it, it's basically flatlined, even though the increase in CO2 emissions is higher than ever. So there's something off with this kind of thinking. And, and technically, for those of you who are engineering minded, this has to do with the fact that greenhouse effect is a logarithmic effect, not a geometric effect, and therefore you'd actually expect the warming to diminish over time. So which is this, this kind of graph. Yes? Okay, sure, I'm, I'm happy to clarify that. And I talk about this extensively in chapter four of the book. So there's this issue of, do you use the term global warming or climate change? This has been, so chronologically it's interesting what happened is the dominant term used was global warming. And then what happened is that worldwide average temperatures were not increasing at the rate predicted by the models. And so then the popular terminology became climate change, which has sort of a, a more vague meaning and uh, there's a lot of advantages that, um, you see, I just say something, let me just uh, get something. In, but in terms of, the, let's think about what the theory actually is. So the, the core of the theory is, is, has to do with CO2. So CO2 is an infrared absorber, it causes warming. So the theory is that as the Earth warms more and more, that's one theory, that's one. Stage one is the Earth will warm very, very rapidly. Stage two is that will cause climate to be more negative to human life than it otherwise be. They'll call it destabilized. The climate is not stable, so I don't think it makes sense, but they'll say there will be more and more negative dramatic events, like more hurricanes, more floods, et cetera, et cetera. And then kind of the third thing is then it's going to be really rough for us, we won't be able to cope with it. Um, but the, the climate change is theoretically derived from the global warming. So if it doesn't warm, the theory doesn't say there's no climate. CO2 is not like causing a hurricane by itself. It's causing a hurricane via warming. So that's why I focus on warming because warming is the root of it. So if you look in chapter four of the book, I show the statistics about things like storms and storm energy, and in general, those have remained pretty steady. They vary over time, but they're pretty steady, and that's not surprising because it hasn't warmed much. So I would just say that it's been very misleading for people to call it climate change to ignore the fact that there hasn't been warming because theoretically, the warming is the cause of the climate change. Oh, no, I wasn't talking about the terms of global warming or climate change. I was just saying that there is a difference and no, no, but causality, but causally, they're linked. That's the point. No, causally, they're linked. But, if, but for this graph, if you're measuring temperature, but refer, referring to climate change, if you're looking at that scale, I don't think it gives an accurate depiction of climate change over time to say that it's not. But it would be the, the point is it would be temperature. It would be is this is this is is the core prediction of this, which is the temperatures will rise, causing this kind of climate change. True. If if the climate change is dependent on the temperature, the temperature doesn't rise. It's done. If there was any change in the climate, it'd have to be from other factors. But it's anyway. I'd recommend just checking out the sources uh, on that one. 
So just to give you a sense of the, the, the amount of warming, though, that has occurred, because it's often like, oh, it's hot. What do we do? It's so much hotter. So if you put it on the scale of um, how much warmer it is, has it gotten, if you're talking about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, this is just the daily temperature range in New York. So imagine just moving this up just a millimeter or two millimeters, and that's what your ear is like. And what that means is that day to day, you experience almost the exact same temperatures. You can't really tell a difference. So the fact is that this, this whole prediction has not materialized of runaway global warming. It's gotten a little bit warmer, which is what you would expect from the mild side effect there, but it just hasn't happened. So this is one aspect of it. I think the, here's the most interesting question for me, though. If I want to know the big picture, ultimately I'm asking, what are the benefits and risks for human life? Are human beings better or worse off now? Is there really a climate-related catastrophe for human beings? And the statistic, the most important statistic here that's almost never mentioned is called climate-related deaths. So this, this catalogs how many people are actually dying over time from floods, droughts, storms, extreme heat, extreme cold, wildfires, etc. So in the news, we'll always hear, oh, this, you know, this fire was caused by this, or this is the worst ever. But you don't really hear big picture, what are the actual numbers? What's happening? What's happened over the last 30 years as these doomsday predictions have happened? So here, here are the actual up-to-date numbers on climate-related deaths over time. And by the way, John Holger, who's the leading science advisor, said in 1985 predicted as many as a billion people would die from CO2-related or climate-induced famine. And this is five years from now. By the way, malnutrition since then has gone down by 40%. So here's climate-related deaths. So it's the more fossil fuels we use, the fewer climate-related deaths we have. And this kind of came up earlier. What it points to is we're taught to think of climate wrong. We're taught to think of climate as something that's naturally perfect and safe and stable. But it's not. Climate is naturally variable, it's naturally volatile, and it's naturally vicious. Climate is not trying to be our friend. It's not trying to be nice to us. We need to master it. So the, the key concept here is that nature doesn't give us a safe climate that we make dangerous. It gives us a dangerous climate that we need to make safe. And one of the big ways we do that is by producing lots and lots of energy to have things like air conditioning, to have things like sturdy buildings, um, you know, to have things like modern satellites that can uh, predict the weather, to have drought relief convoys. Drought-related deaths in the last 80 years are down 99.98% because we now have the means of actually alleviating drought. But nobody mentions that because nobody even considers that there could be positive environmental benefits. There could be environmental be benefits from fossil fuels. So what people are ignoring is that when we have a better source of energy that gives more energy to billions of people, that allows them not just to have a better economy, but a better environment. So if we talk about the risks of fossil fuels in terms of climate, it is a, a guaranteed deadly threat not to use fossil fuels for people's climate around the world. Because the people who can't cope with climate are people who don't have energy, people who don't have industry. So if you care about people being safe from storms and floods and droughts, don't think about, oh my gosh, the temperature is at 28 degrees Celsius, 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, think about people actually, people need to industrialize. People need energy to protect themselves from climate. We need to master uh, climate. So I understand it's a new concept, I talk about it for two chapters in the moral case for fossil fuels, but I think it's, it's really important not to think of nature as something that's perfect and then we mess it up, but as something that has a lot of potential but that we need to actualize. So I think that, that this is really kind of the key. The reason the experts get it wrong is that they fail to think big picture. And I'll, I'll start with, I want to wrap up now. Um, but it, it, is, it is just on issue after issue, I just want you to notice they're not thinking of the benefits, they're only thinking about the risks, or they're underplaying the benefits and exaggerating the risks. And this makes it really hard to deal with legitimate issues like real uh, kinds of pollution, where in certain places, like in China, there are policies that harm people. And so uh, you mentioned the issue of, of you know, causes of death, like people dying early because of inhaling certain forms of smoke. Now, 
you have to look really carefully at those studies because tons and tons of studies, uh, many more studies claim causation than can actually prove it. But you obviously have a lot of unpleasant air that people are breathing there, and that should be the kind of focus. But, but you should focus on, hey, let's improve the air quality, not let's reduce our ability to improve our lives because you have a place in China where even with whatever damage the air quality has done, people live far longer in the cities than in the country, and they live far longer now than they did below the fossil, before fossil fuels. It's an incredible net benefit that we're undercutting. Uh, I'll, you can ask him the question here, but um, I need to wrap up. So it's not only do the overall benefits of fossil fuels outweigh the risk, but the environmental benefits outweigh the environmental risks. So just to wrap up, so the two big ideas today are big picture thinking, so looking at all the benefits and all the risks and all the alternatives. And then I believe that if you use big picture thinking with that issue, you conclude that fossil fuels are not this self-destructive addiction that's destroying our planet. They are a life-enhancing technology that's improving our planet. Um, so I'll take questions for a minute. We need to have the panel. Um, if any of you want to get in touch with me, I didn't write my email, but it's alex at alexepstein.com. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. And then anyone wants to take a look at the, the first chapter of the book for free and some of the graphics, it's moralcaseforfossilfuels.com. Uh, thank you for having me, and we'll do questions in the panel. Do, do you and I have the same level of agreement on the fundamentality of energy 
in these other things. My indication is at this point we don't have the same no, I level. Of, you that energy is no, no. a major factor. What I'm saying by isolating just that fossil fuel asset and then citing that as a causative factor for all of these other. No, but I, so so I was going to say I explained that it was a causative factor. So you can you can disagree with my explanation in regards to insufficient, but I did explain it. So I think that's I think I tried to be fair. And I think I was. Okay. Yes. Not just that one chart, but several charts where you say that that is increase in CO, CO2 that is being emitted, and here is the, the increase in life expectancy, uh -huh. and the reduction in number of deaths. The, the, the way it was put forward, these two charts put together, essentially sort of implied. I mean, it seemed like you were implying that that higher use of fossil fuels is is good because it's due to less uh, fuel deaths and stuff, but that's hardly the case. I mean, well, oh, that's okay. So what's so you made an assertion that I disagree with, but, but what's the question? The the point is okay. No, well, do you have a question? Yes, I do have a question. Okay. The, the way I understand this whole, whole argument in front of forward is it's not a modern case for fossil fuels, it's a modern case for energy. Uh -huh. The reason those things are going down is because we have more energy. Uh -huh. It happens to be the case that, that fossil fuels at this point of time, according to your argument, are the most efficient and the cost right. way to get energy. But if, if we had access, if instead of fossil fuels at this point of time, our technology was such that we had equal access of equal efficiency and, and <coughs> minimal cost to some other form, then you would basically be all for it, according to your argument, right? Correct. So what's the question? So the, the question is, is I, why is it that you are making a modern case for fossil fuels? Why are you not saying it's a modern case for more energy? And we can look at other well, it's, it, it's both, but the, so so it, so I think the example of vaccines and disease prevention is is pretty exact here. So you can say, well, you showed all these benefits of vaccines for disease prevention, but aren't you just making a moral case for disease prevention? But I have spent the first third of it explaining, well, these are a unique form of disease prevention. No other technology can come close. And this technology is under attack. So those are the two ingredients. One, it's a uniquely positive form of this. So you can say it's energy, but it's not energy. There's no such thing as energy in general. There's only specific forms of energy that specific people use. And so the, the specific industry, the fossil fuel industry, that's making it possible for the vast amount, of, uh, vast majority of us to have cheap, plentiful, reliable energy, that is under attack for being evil. So what I'm saying is, this is not a uniquely bad force in the world. This is a uniquely good force in the world. So that those are the two aspects. Right, but but it's making it possible at this point because that's where the technology is. But, okay, but I, I think I just completely answered that with the vaccines analogy. I, I, I mean, I can say that's it's vaccines are only protecting us because that's where the technology is. And in my future, we'll have green scenes, which will be much better. But they're not. Let's take another exist. question from the back, and then we'll bring the panel up. Since this seems to be the moral case for fossil fuels, I'll pose a more philosophical question for you. But, um, uh, do you think that the times will change morality? Like uh, previously, we've had consumption as the primary focus of our economy. In the future, perhaps fossil fuels won't be as used because we're not looking for the consumption of plastic bottles. So mm -hmm. in, in your regard, it's morality and fossil fuels. I think the, the, the serious question here in the long run is consumption and the rate of air for us. So do you think time would eventually just change your opinion? We, we may not need fossil fuels. We have so a couple of perspectives, though. What is, I just want to make clear, since there wasn't an emphasis in the talk, and it's much more of an emphasis in the book. Uh, as this gentleman indicated, well, criticizing me, but still accurately, the core thing is wanting the best energy technology to improve our lives. So, for example, uh, I'm a huge advocate of nuclear, hydro, and these things, incidentally, but not incidentally, importantly, are opposed by the same environmentalist groups who oppose fossil fuels, even though they emit no CO2. And that kind of gets to the second thing, which is, is really to answer the question of why do people who claim to care about CO2 emissions oppose the only forms of cheap, reliable energy that can minimize CO2 emissions. That's certainly not eliminate at all. 
And that goes to, there are really two ways of thinking about our environment, thinking about nature. And this is the philosophical issue that your question about consumption involves. One is, the way to think about our planet is we want to, our goal is to minimize our impact on the planet. That is the goal. That's the standard by which we judge things morally. The other one is we want to maximize human well-being on this planet. So are we optimizing for human well-being? Are we optimizing for minimizing human impact? And there's a real tension, because often we talk about human life, but often we talk about, let's minimize our impact. But not, we want to minimize negative impacts on us, but overall, the way we survive is by having an enormous amount of impact on the planet. So I, I morally, I'm a humanist. I'm for whatever maximizes human well-being, and that's how I judge everything. And ultimately, the people, the leaders of the anti-fossil fuel movement, I believe, it's not that they're really confused about the benefits and risks of fossil fuels to human beings. They, if you look at them historically, really just think we're doing way too much. We're moving too many things around, we're building too many things, we're mining too much, we're too industrial, too many plastic bottles. Um, and I think that might be true in some instance, but in general, no, we need to keep improving uh, the planet. So fossil fuels are an amazing way of making our planet a better place to live. And we should keep looking for better and better technologies uh, to do that. So I hope we don't get to the era where people think consumption is evil because you need to consume to live. At this point, I'd like the panelists that we've brought together to briefly introduce themselves. Alex, you're welcome to stand or if you want to. I feel like I have an unfair advantage. Um, well, I, I'm mostly on here with the bill, so I'll just. There's just, a room for you to sit down. Oh, I can sit. Perfect. Yes. Great. Dr. French. I'm Dr. Todd French. I'm an associate professor in chemical engineering. Um, I've been at Mississippi State for 15 years now as a professor. Um, my areas of research are um, biofuels, um, food from biomass. And I've actually done enhanced oil recovery and will continue to do it. I'm not opposed to oil, um, as some people are. Uh, Dr. John Bickle, um, I'm professor of philosophy and the head of the Department of Philosophy and Religion here at uh, Mississippi State. I've been here for six years. I came here from the University of Cincinnati, um, where I was head of the philosophy department for nine years there. Um, I'm also a neuroscientist. I'm on uh, faculty at the Medical Center in Jackson. Uh, and I'm a philosopher of science and neuroscientist by training um, with, some, with also some interest in uh, the, uh, the way that uh, the various kinds of moral uh, ideas are, uh, are, are realized in our neural structures. I'm Dr. Renee Clary. I'm in the Department of Geosciences. I'm an associate professor. Um, I came to Mississippi State in 2006. Um, I came from Louisiana, so I have a, a very strong petroleum connection uh, from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. My chief research area is in geoscience education, how to produce a geo-literate public so that we can make wise decisions with regards to environmental issues that come our way. Uh, I'm Raza Reddy from Plant and Soil Sciences. Uh, I work with um, plants and plant physiology area, how plants respond to the environmental conditions. I've been here for more than 25 years at Mississippi State. Let's thank our panel for joining us. I, I anticipate more questions from our audience, but I'll, I'll start by asking a question. I think the best way to handle this is to allow uh, Mr. Epstein to answer and then all the panelists to have time to answer as well. Um, I just ask that everyone keep their answers relatively brief so we can answer as many questions as possible with the 40 minutes that we have left. So my question to, to begin is what should the U.S. energy policy be for the next generation? Yeah, I'm really just here with the other side since I'll be really brief. Uh, I classify mine as energy liberation. So having as much freedom as possible to produce and consume energy. And there are a lot of aspects of that, but a couple of interesting issues involve uh, delineating property rights. Like, for example, right now the government uh, controls huge, huge amounts of land uh, that I don't think it should, that prohibits a lot of mining and drilling and that kind of thing. Um, but also, as, as it came up, there are really interesting issues of what are the right thresholds uh, for you know, protecting human health and safety. And I, I talk about it in chapter seven of my book, how you can go wrong both ways. Like, if you're insufficiently uh, low threshold, it, 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 you, you, know, you can have a situation like in China, 
But if you have a threshold that's way too low, that, that for instance, I think in the case of ozone, they are restricting it to levels that make no sense, that are way too low, you can end up restricting things in an unhealthy uh, way. So I think those are two of the interesting issues. I think the energy policy um, should include oil and the exploration of more oil from a national security standpoint. And I also think that the, the United States should diversify. Um, there are problems with oil. When oil drops below a certain point, these sources that Mr. Epstein are talking about become economically unfeasible to go after. Um, it's only feasible when they're above $50 a barrel for some of these technologies, for some of these oil sources to be there. Now, when oil starts to reach $100 a barrel, like we've seen in the past, then a lot of the alternative fuels can become cost uh, competitive with some of those. And there are a lot more technologies than what Mr. Epstein referenced in his book. Um, there are things that are being developed that he's not aware of. There are a lot of people that a lot of people are not aware of. And I think these things need to be continued. I think DOE is blind um, and arrogant in the way they approach their, um, their portfolio, the way they do research. Um, they're very uh, monoscopic in the way they view their things. They tend to focus on one technology and dump billions of dollars in the hope and prayer that it works out and it hasn't panned out for them um, yet. Um, but I think that this needs to be a diverse portfolio in the way that we approach things um, in our fuels. Great, thanks. Um, uh, I, I, will, uh, I will say that one thing that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Alex said that I certainly agree with as a committed political libertarian is this emphasis on, uh, on individual liberty. Um, but I also want to raise one point. I don't have any recommendations for U.S. energy policy um, over the next you know, certain amount of years. But there's one thing that worries me a little bit about the way that the discussion, this big picture discussion, has been going, at least within this particular forum. It's easy to slide into a kind of simple-minded, consequentialist ethics when you're thinking about these kinds of, these kinds of issues. You know, weigh up the cost, weigh up the benefits, what's going to be the greatest good for the greatest number. But that's only one of at least three major frameworks for thinking about ethical issues um, within, uh, within Western ethics itself. Um, and I am more than, I'm convinced, I'm not sure if this is true or not, and I have to see evidence for it, but I'm also convinced that some of the challenges, the challengers to the kind of view that, uh, that Alex was presenting are not utilitarians, they're not consequentialists. They have another kind of ethical framework, more of a sort of duty-based ethical framework. So this point he was kind of hitting on at the end of his last few remarks about his humanism versus this perhaps non-interventionism, I think it's actually a broader dispute um, and it's one that I think needs to inform things like energy policy, and that is what is the ethical framework that we're going to use to address these kinds of issues? Are we going to stick with a kind of simple, a simple utilitarian consequentialist ethics, or is that the wrong general framework for ethical thinking, for thinking about these kinds of issues? I don't have much uh, more to add. I, I totally agree with Dr. French that uh, we do need to diversify. And I know that in my lifetime, if I think of the major um, changes that I've experienced, and I'm old, um, I would say it's been in telecommunications. But I look back at my grandmother and where she lived and how she interacted with the environment, and you can see the tremendous impact that fossil fuels had on her during her lifetime. But we focused a lot of our attention into fossil fuel recovery. And once we have that infrastructure there, we tend to go after that. We keep it going. But I do think it's time to diversify and look at other sources of energy so that we can be poised for the future. I, I think it's more diversified uh, policies will be the right thing to do it uh, so that we can invest uh, technologies on different uh, energy sources. How about a question from our audience that all of our panelists can answer? Dr. Kandu. So uh, all these predictions, what went wrong? Why they are so wrong? Is that like typical the predictions they made, they basically probably, I don't know, I'm not a kind of scientist, they use some model, the models are wrong, all the other, all the inputs are wrong, something happened, I mean, this, this map there, probably. So that's my question, what went wrong? Are you, you just referring, I mean, because there's, there's two sets of predictions that are sort of, irredeemably wrong. Uh, there's the climate ones, but also the resource ones. 
So are you referring to both of those? Or no, just I'm one? talking about the, the catastrophic fair, like a climate change, like a temperature will go run away and everything. Like, as you said, 1986, like 20, 20 has 1 billion people to die based on some assumptions, and the temperature will go up like that. And that did not happen. So that means that there's something, some assumptions are made that's not probably right or something. something. Yeah, and I think when you have people predicting complex systems and claiming high degrees of confidence in it, that's generally something to be suspicious of. So if you take the realm of economics and you know, the, the recent crash, still fairly recent, uh, you have people who had very high public degrees of confidence that there was no housing bubble and, and people who acted accordingly and many models by smart people, but they, they didn't have a real ability to simulate the system um, and that often occurs. It's very hard to simulate complex systems, and in climate science, people have no, nothing resembling their ability to simulate that system. So what happens is the people who, one dynamic is the people who are most irresponsible in claiming confidence that is unwarranted get the most uh, attention. This has happened in all sorts of movements historically, including really tragically, say, in like eugenics, where you have these predictions that you know, the gene pool is degrading and you can't allow people to procreate freely and because it's going to lead to this kind of thing. There's just these, these kinds of theories that are wrong, but people make them very, very confidently. So um, there's also the issue of underlying bias, right, which goes to the humanism issue, which is that there's, there's this view of we should minimize our impact on the planet. And part of the underlying, I would say, theology of that is that nature is like a fragile mother to us. It's like this fragile system that if we disrupt, if we impact, something bad is bound to happen. But it has a similar relationship with like a God and a religion. If we violate, if we go against God's will, there's going to be a hell. Well, here it's if we go against, you know, nature's will, nature is seen as a God, there's going to be a kind of hell. And that, that kind of viewpoint, which they'll call the delicate balance, that's really a theology. It's not objectively based in science, but that viewpoint leads to expectations. And if you read Holdren's work over the last 40 years, He's totally mired in this. He thinks that we are just ruiners of the planet and we're going to bring about an apocalypse and no amount of evidence will change his theory. He just keeps changing it. He, he just keeps changing the doomsday. So let's let the panelists comment on that. We'll start the other direction if I'm ready. Uh, I'm, I'm not a climate scientist, but it is a, a climate, global climate is a very complex process and uh, it's not easy to, uh, you cannot hold on that is, that is 20 or 30 years before it, whatever the prediction is. Understanding at that time is much different, and the modeling component at that time was much different. You cannot hold on what is said 20, 30 years back today. <coughs> so it's a very complex system. It is not easy to understand. Well, so the predictions are evolving over time. You cannot hold something that was said 30, 40 years back. The predictions are evolving as we learn more about science and the simulations, it's, it's improving all the time. Okay. And I would also bring in that um, we've heard predictions, on, we've seen predictions on the screen from, what about, half a dozen people. And um, I can guarantee you there are a lot more scientists who have been using um, climate modeling from the 70s onward and have made predictions. So the opinions that you saw were a very, very, very small group of all the predictions that were made. We saw extremist predictions. Um, go back to, um, to what Alex advocates, and I think this is really important. If you want to find the answers, go to the experts. Ehrlich was very, very vocal. Um, does anyone know what Ehrlich's specialty is? I do. He's a lot of doctors. That's right. He's a butterfly scientist, OK? <laughs> so he is making broad generalizations, and he's very vocal. And scientists know that not everyone who sits back in the lab and does the work is necessarily the one who's invited to Johnny Carson's uh, late night show. So although there were a lot of people doing the science, uh, not everyone was getting equal time. So what you saw was a very select, small group of quotes and predictions that does not represent the entire scientific community. And you had a very good point. We cannot be accountable for something that was predicted 30 years ago. New data come in. And science is not static. That's the very, very important take home message here. Science is not static. It's through replication that we learn and advance. 
So predictions from 30 years ago don't hold now. Right. Uh, can I just address this? I think it's significant. I just disagree with that significantly. I'll jump in. Um, in terms of the, the quality of the climate predictions and how those are improved, one thing is if, if it is indeed true that they have improved uh, dramatically, it would at least be necessary for the leaders, and James Hansen is still the public leader at the center, to concede that they have been vastly wrong in the past. So if, if you if you make vocal predictions, you tell people to base their lives on it. They were telling China to be cut down on fossil fuels. They were telling them something deadly. They were wrong. They would have killed people if they were right. You can't just say, oh, sorry, I, I got it wrong by a couple decades. Let me change it now. So there's a huge amount of intellectual responsibility uh, about it. In terms of the state of the current models, uh, chapter four of the book, I go into that a lot. Uh, they completely overpredict warming, and there's also a whole problem of, you can say, oh, today's model is the best, big problem, you have no precedent to them. So you have to have some sort of, if you're, if you're judging predictive models, you have to go by the predictive record. That, that's a big part of it, and again, they don't concede it. The other thing is, did I, did I share you? Uh, no, these are, these are world leaders of public opinion, and what that, this is the focus. I'm not saying every scientist agrees with these guys. That's exactly the point, they do not. But the view that's been represented, this is an addiction, this is gonna ruin our lives. Part of that mechanism is that the people with the most extreme views have been given the biggest platform and those are the predictions that you are being asked to act on. So the whole premise of this is you are being told, get off this stuff, it's bad. These deadly things are gonna happen. So if the scientific community believes that it's being misrepresented by extremists, which it is, the scientific community has a moral obligation to speak up. And I would say that the scientific community in climate has been abominably silent about this issue. And what they do is they don't want to get kicked out of societies. So societies put out statements that do not represent the views of their members, the members do not speak up, and it's really irresponsible. So to the extent that Ehrlich didn't represent the views of scientists, where the heck were all the ecologists saying, this guy is a crank? They were silent. Yeah, please. Um, I want to. I want to take out. I want to take on an issue with the use of, of of the way that computer simulation is done in particular branches of science. Now, I mean, I'm coming from a perspective both in the philosophy of science and in neurobiology that emphasizes experiment, that emphasizes experiment on the bench, especially if you're trying to ferret out the difference between correlation and cause. And it seems to me that that one of the, the reliance upon computer simulations is one of the huge reasons why so much of this has gotten so wrong for so long. Um, we, I was, I was part of a lab in graduate school that was one of the earliest labs in neuroscience to actually use computer simulations. But we did it for one purpose and one purpose only: to make predictions that we could go and test in the on the bench in the lab. There was, there was not some idea that the simulation was a scientific end in itself. And I think that, that, that now I, I understand that some sciences are forced to rely more heavily on computer simulations than they are on intervention experiments to find causal mechanisms. But to the extent that a science has to do that, it should be less confident as a matter of epistemology in terms of its confidence in, 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 in its predictions and certainly in its explanations. Yeah, I think that probably with a lot of those models they were using back then was um, it's with anything that's this complicated as Alex has alluded to. It, knowing all the variables, it's just impossible and how these variables interrelate with one another and being able to accurately predict that. And you know a lot of these times um, models are done to show um, a method uh, to what they want to see happen. It's unfortunate that scientists push their stuff that way instead of relying on just what the facts, the data are. They, they have, some of them have an agenda, and it's unfortunate that they do that. Uh, but I have issue with what Alex said about the, um, the environment and about, the, you know, the increasing the growth and the population within these things. I've been doing biological research now for <clears throat> close to 30 years. Every environment, without exception, has a carrying capacity. Period. There, this is a natural law. It, it will not go above that. If it does, it's doomed to failure. Energy is part of that. But every living system on this planet requires water, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and trace elements. And we're racing with the increase in India and China 
and putting more energy in and these people are proliferating and no don't walk away from here thinking dr french would let somebody go hungry if i personally met them i would not do that but we have to think of ourselves as a as a race it's more than just us it's more than just us here now we have the generations that are coming after and as these populations as alex put up in his slide start to race towards that we will plateau make no mistake we will plateau and the reason why is because we're going to find the rate limiting step in that equation there's going to be something that's going to come up that's going to prevent life populations from increasing anymore another danger to the populations increasing is diseases he talked about all the wonderful antibiotics and all the wonderful vaccines and they are there's no question about the uh, improvement to life that those things have made. But when these rare, these unique diseases start cropping up and they don't, um, uh, are not treated with the current vaccines or not treated with the antibiotics, we've got problems. This talk of Johnny Carson reminds me when he put the envelope on his head and tried to predict <laughs> what was in the envelope. We have time for one more question from a student in the back here. in our enzymes that's the way basic biology works in order for us to catalyze reactions there are certain elements that are required and once the humans begin to take that up and it's sequestered away life will cease it happens in every aspect from bacteria all the way up to humans we are no different and once we reach this plateau here then the resources are gone there is a reason that the population ceases to grow energy will not take us above that yeah, I mean, this is a, a long discussion. I think people should check out chapter eight of the book. But I think any of those elements you can get into the bodies where you need No, to I'm saying when we deplete them because population is too great. Okay. There, 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 let me make just one point on this on the human ingenuity argument. I mean, I certainly don't want to downplay it. It's an important argument. It does have a logical limit, though. 
There's a really nice cartoon that the philosopher of cognitive scientist Dan Dennett likes to use, um, which basically has a couple of scientists standing by a board just covered with these incomprehensible scrawls of equations and the like. And then right in the middle of the it is a thing, and then a miracle happens. And the other one scientist is saying to the other, I think you should be more explicit in step two here. I have that same kind of feeling about the human ingenuity argument. Sure, uh, it's important, it's certainly the case, but it also has that flair, that flavor of, and then a miracle occurs, a feel to it, when you really push it to its logical extreme, and I'm just a little worried about it being pushed to its logical extreme to solve every single problem. Um, I guess what I, like, I would like to comment on is just the awareness. Um, and I think that we're all intelligent enough to realize that just because you hear it on TV or read it on the internet does not make it factual. So uh, I was out in, um, in 2008 with a group of students in Yellowstone, and they performed beautifully. These were online students who had not applied their, their skills and their content in the field, but they, uh, they applied everything beautifully, and I was just amazed until the conversation came about to climate change. And it was as if science had been sucked out of the room. And if I had closed my eyes and taken away accents, I could have heard Rush Limbaugh and Rachel Maddow and Glenn Beck, but I didn't hear science. And that was the problem. So if in hearing some of these um, very, oh, what do I want to say, um, in hearing some, some very doom and gloom predictions, if we start investigating, then that's a good thing. But don't take something at face value. And what I started doing with my own students is having them go to the actual scientific reports. What do these reports say? How can you transfer this? Did the media take it in context? So go to the original sources, read about it, and make your own decisions based on the science, not what someone else tells you to think. Last um, comment by Dr. Reddy. Um, um, something on this, uh, like, um, escalating CO2 levels, for example, there will be some winners and losers as far as the plants are concerned. So I, I'm not, at this point, not sure whether we have the right to change those, the, the mix of species that is going to happen in, in, in a globally, globally. We are unable, as a human being, we are unable to create something like Rocky Mountain Forest in, in Mississippi. It's humanly impossible to create something like that. And if we make something that is going to plant to the species mix is going to change, then it is going to be a little problem to a certain extent. With the change in CO2, there, is, there will be some winners and losers. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Epstein and our panel for, for participating in this discussion. Let's all thank them.